Enjoy this sit down with Jared Burkholder and Wagner Floriani as they discuss biblical counseling. Biblical counseling is knowing God's word, listening to God's people, and applying God's word to that person in front of you. It's the body caring for one another and coming alongside them in their suffering. I'm your host, Aaron Miller, pastor of Equipping at Grace Baptist Church in Santa Clarita, California. Welcome to Magnify. I hate all the prepackaged questions. What'd you have for breakfast, Wagner? I did not. That's why I'm ready. You a non breakfast eater? Usually, especially if I have to do something, breakfast just gets my head cloudy. Really? Food in general gets my head cloudy. Really? I think you're doing food wrong. Or just some kind of autoimmune disease that I'm not aware of. You know, that's also a thought. Have you ever tried the caveman diet? Just going gluten free. The caveman diet? Just like healthy, free range meats. There's so many wonderful fads out there. My favorite was a guy that I worked with in North Carolina. He and his dad both went on the cookie diet. I'm not making it up. It was like these dense protein laden cookies and you would eat, you would replace two meals with cookies and then have one normal meal. And so you replace a full meal with like a cookie, with just a laced up cookie, like a dense cookie. That seemed like a little, like maybe we've, maybe we've hit rock bottom here. Yeah, no doubt. I tried that with Oreos and it was a different. Different experience, I'm sure. Probably a lot more, you know, enjoyable. Because the one thing I'm thinking about, these cookies can't taste good. Oh, gosh, no. Yeah, no way. Well, we're coming back, right, from visiting fam in July. Made this pit stop in Sacramento, as one does. And... As one does. Love Sacramento. Dude, hands down, the worst airport food, like, ever. Have you been to the Vegas airport? I have. That's just overpriced. That's It's just disgusting. Like, the carpet is oozing. (laughs) Like, it's literally moisture coming up from the car 100 percent. yeah it's a it's a direct pipeline from you know the casino straight into the airport but yeah i just remembered distinctly stopping in sacramento this past july and trying to figure out okay i need to do all the things that you do when you're traveling with a kid right Mm -hmm. change a diaper yep hydrate take a couple steps see if there anyone who's gonna take a nap and at some point i should eat something yep and i must walk that strip of the airport like two or three times in a row trying to find something and it's all these either fancy sit down uh, restaurants or really weird like you know those magazine stands that oh, like yeah. sell food too yep and you're like where did these sandwiches come from it's and here's books the thing in sandwiches 16 20 bucks a pop mm-hmm. for a colorfully looking sketchy looking sandwich we flew this summer with all the kids and so we like delayed lunch until we got on the plane to burn time because we had a five-hour flight but it it just feels wrong to pull out food that like fills the airplane with aromas you know what i mean like it feels morally (laughs) wrong i don't know if anyone's done any work on the ethics i mean you're literally creating a hostage situation is what you're doing yeah like sometimes people are pulling out like stews or lasagnas or something like you know what like i feel like there should be (laughs) a three-course meal somebody had sushi one time like don't you bring fish on this plane man yeah. Like, I think we should all throw you out. Which you have to presume is, is you know, gas station sushi as well, just based on okay. the quality of that Someone experience. Someone in my neighborhood, probably weekly, maybe daily, is buying 7-Eleven sushi and eating it in between 7-Eleven and my house wow. and leaving the chopsticks and container on the sidewalk. Like regularly. It's not the same container because they mix it just up. Just leaving the Sometimes a California roll. Sometimes they're doing a salmon roll. I'm already skeptical of the hot dog and that's not even real food. Can you imagine putting raw fish yeah, 7-Eleven? Yeah, I mean, the obvious thing is body. the insides of this person is probably not, you know, 100. I mean, they, they're an American hero. They can eat whatever they want. Truly. <laughs> they can eat whatever they want. <laughs> the proverbial, uh, what, is that? what is that phrase? Iron, iron, iron stomach. stomach. Yeah, iron that's stomach. it. That's it. Hey, Jared, fun parenting question, just because I'm in that season of life right now. Yeah. Uh, do all your kids share the same bottle? Gosh, no. no like, like a drinking water. Like say you guys are all in about, you know. I mean, if we have to, we will. So like you won't give your water bottle to your kids. My to kids sit. don't touch my water bottle. That's amazing. Do you, can, do you, it's just. I do it all the time. It's like a meal in there when they're done. Oh, 100%. Oh, yeah. my word. Yeah. It's, it's, it's some fun treats it's afterwards unreal. for sure. Maybe I was raised in a, you know, in a third world country longer than you have. We guys had like one water bottle for the whole town, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The well. <laughs> the well where you. Yeah. 100%. 100%. <laughs> well, listeners, you can tell from this exchange, I'm here with our director of care and counseling, yeah. Wagner Floriani. Wagner has been at Grace for 10 years, pushing 10? 2013 is when I first stepped foot on this campus. Look at that. You've served in how many different roles here? Yeah, several. So I first came in just as a church member, as everyone. Then 
very shortly thereafter, when I started seminary, became an intern serving with both student ministries and college ministry at the time. What was it? 2017 when I came on staff full time, because I was about two, three years where I was just an intern. Yeah. You know, trolling Jared, stealing his furniture, things like that. You as did one does. take a couple pieces, yeah, actually. It was, was a really good time. Back. Great ways to bond early on. Well, it's yeah. funny. When someone leaves here, it is like piranhas on a steak. Like, we all descend in the office and take things. Yeah. You know, I was taking things out of Gabe's office before he even left. <laughs> well, that was a whole other thing because there was, I don't know if you remember the GMA days, you know, oh, that was buddy. the wild, wild west back then. Listen, if you weren't here then, we had these modular buildings out there and all the student ministry staff had this one office separate from everything else. Right. And it was an amazing place. Exactly. And that's what I mean by Wild Wild West. Like it was, it was free range, free game. <laughs> <laughs> you come in here. No running a, water. You're a lawn to yourself, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually no running water. That's a fact. <laughs> it's amazing out there. <laughs> yeah. The GMOTs were gone by the time I became a full-time staff. So maybe that was the cue. And at that point I was serving as um, in adult discipleship, kind of giving support to different ABF leaders, grace group leaders, and really putting energy in men's ministry at the time. Um, so that was 17, if my memory serves correctly. Took a two-year hiatus in Kentucky while I was doing some schooling out there. In starting from 2019, came back here in 2021, helped out with Grace U, kind of getting into restart after COVID. And in the last year and a half, about 18 months or so, in this role as care and counseling director. So been a fun ride. You did college and first seminary out here, second mm -hmm. seminary in Louisville, and now are back. During that time, the Lord has also given you a family. Indeed. Tell us about that. Yeah. So when I was in Kentucky, actually, I uh, got to meet my wife, Sid, while she was here, which is a great way to get to know somebody 3,000 miles apart. And part of what brought me back here was uh, to get married, which was a wonderful choice. We've been married since 2021. Uh, and now we have baby Juniper, who is just over a year old, and we have one more baby girl on the way, which by the time this comes out, she, well, she better be out here. It by, better be scary if she wasn't. By the time yeah. she's out, yeah, otherwise she's going to be grounded for a long time. So yeah, baby Juniper and Luana is our newest Luana, I heard the name in. Yeah. That's amazing. Yep. So today we want to talk about biblical counseling, just counseling in general. I think... So many people have so many strong, visceral reactions to biblical counseling on either end of the spectrum, right? There are those who think that only a very strict uh, biblical counseling model is represents Christian faithfulness. Anything other than that represents compromise mm -hmm. and will certainly doom the participant to a fiery judgment. Other people see that uh, have had a bad experience with biblical counseling. They kind of see it as take two scriptures and call me in the morning kind of thing. So there's a lot of strong opinions about that. Why don't you just talk about how you and how grace has navigated that. Because one of the things I love about us is we don't like hang a sign out that we're with this particular organization right. or this particular tribe. We've pillaged many worlds to kind of pull the best from lots of different camps. So talk about how you've approached that, how Joe's approached that, how we've approached that as a church. Yeah, those are great questions because I think so much of the reaction that you're talking about has to do with an experience that is negative, right? So regardless of the spectrum in which someone is coming from this conversation, they really are reacting to some degree to a, to a negative experience, be that a uh, negative experience of someone that only treated and cared for someone on a physical standpoint, as if all that it means to be a human being is to be a brain on a stick, right? That if you just get your inner chemistry straight, then you're going to be the kind of person that you need to be and, you know, and your kids will not get in your nerves anymore. Mm -hmm. That's one end of the spectrum that you just would neglect any kind of spiritual connotations to my behavior. But then the other end of the spectrum is this uh, kind of experience that would demand a almost a spiritual kind of perfection, right? That uh, there is an idol and a sin behind every mm -hmm. kind of dysfunction and every kind of uh, difficult behavior. And those things may or may not be true, right? One of the things that we do well here at Grace is we are very intentional about not uh, rocking flags <laughs> yeah. here. Yep. But at the same time, we, we do a very good job of maintaining a, 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 a network of friendships and collaboration. And I think there's just a spirit of collaboration that I think is evident, even just by navigating our offices, right? And then as you get to know our people, we do really well at desiring at least, right? To be neighbors with folks in our valley, be neighbors with folks that would partner with us in ministry. So when we're thinking about biblical counseling in particular, that's a similar kind of spirit that our goal when we're thinking through counseling is not to represent, definitely not to be, represent the entirety of the biblical counseling movement, but certainly to care for our people. I think that focus of, of member care is one that 
to some degree, even made sense for me to come back to Kentucky to take this job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Right? I think when we're talking about biblical counseling, at least when we talk about biblical counseling and grace, really the language that we use consistently is one of member care. What does it look like to care for the physical and spiritual needs of our people, especially in seasons of profound trial and suffering, right? If there's one thing that is consistent in life is that the experience of suffering is one that is disorienting. Uh, so when we're talking about biblical counseling, we really are describing that experience of coming alongside another church member with the clarity and wisdom of God's word and with the desire of leaning on together on how would the Lord help us through seasons of profound suffering, through seasons of profound confusion. Certainly, there is more that we can talk about that, but at minimum, right? At minimum, we're talking about biblical counseling. What we don't want to hijack is the simple one anothering experience that happens when one member cares for another member with Bible open. Yeah, sometimes I think just the very word biblical counseling can be a, a trigger point, but I mean, we're really talking about soul care, right? We're talking about yeah. that as pastors and directors, as as people who care about the gospel of Jesus Christ and stand on the sufficiency of God's word, we just get to minister to people's souls, right? Mm-hmm. I think it's interesting Tons of people have written recently, uh, I mean, this is a reason, but Charles Taylor, Truman, Alan Noble, others have written about how therapy has become a gospel unto itself. Mm. You listen to any podcast from people in Hollywood, musicians, artists, authors, everyone's talking about how they're in therapy. And there's a, a salvation or a redemptive ethos through that, right? That if I can just go through therapy and figure myself out, then I can kind of fix my own problems. How, yeah. how do you see that in the culture around us? And What's the insufficiency there, right? So if everyone around us is going, therapy really helps. Right. You know, as I've discovered myself, I, I feel like there's been a liberation and, and even a salvation. What would we see is wrong with that? Yeah, no, that's a great question because if there's one thing that perhaps 2020 has made everyone a little more comfortable with, and I don't want to overstate this as well because there's still several different kinds of uh, skepticism, hesitation whenever uh, whenever the conversation of counseling comes up. So I'm sympathetic to those two. Yeah. But one of the things that 2020 has really brought to the forefront is the need to do that deep work, right, of investigating what's going on in my heart. Like, why am I responding to life's sufferings and things that are hard in the ways that I respond? And that's not just a Christian instinct. I think that's a human instinct right? To wonder why I do the things that I do, especially when the things that I do cause affliction to me and others. And trying to make sense out of that. I think it's a, it's a very appropriate question. I think if we're talking about the world more broadly, that is an appropriate instinct. Mm -hmm. First, I want to acknowledge again, just that human instinct, right? Of my suffering is supposed to be this clarion call, right? This, what C.S. Lewis calls the megaphone of of God talking to me and addressing me, right? And our our suffering is always going to do that. But I I think it it is insufficient, right? It's an insufficient message when uh, my suffering is only giving, ringing alarm bells, Mm -hmm. right? Without offering me a a narrative that is satisfactory, especially if that narrative doesn't doesn't include God in the picture, Mm -hmm. right? I think so much of common answers to suffering and perhaps that's that's more true in secular forms of counseling and care. The primary goal is one of symptom relief, right? The primary goal of so much of counseling and even the experience of the counselees often, right? Yeah. It is this, how can I make this to stop? How can I get some kind of relief for the anxiety that doesn't seem to go away? How can I get some kind of relief for the sleepless nights? Some kind of relief because I don't want to be responding to conflict in my marriage this way and this way and this way. Part of why I say that's unsatisfactory is what happens when I address, right, one aspect of relief in this kind of suffering, and then the next kind of suffering comes, right? The next kind of trial comes. Am I just going to have to restart a cycle all again, or will there be some lessons at some point that I'm going to learn to figure it out? Oftentimes, therapy is talked about as if it's the silver bullet, mm-hmm. right? That if I just talk to someone about everything going on for 30 minutes every week, uh, then my life automatically is going to get better. Right. And I think that's actually part of what that's insufficient is that it fails to recognize that our human condition, our sinful condition is actually a lot worse than that. It's actually a lot more, uh, th- what is wrong with us is a lot more profound than merely managing life differently. Because if it was merely an issue of lack of knowledge, if it was merely just as an issue of a lack of insight, uh, Google would have given that to us already. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. If I just needed a little, a little piece, a little, just a golden nugget to fix my life and live the perfect life, or even if it's not perfect, just the ideal one. Right. But it is not an issue of knowledge. It's, 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 I think the, the Bible offers us a, a more robust understanding of ourselves. Mm. They recognize that what is wrong with us is actually a lot more rooted into, into who we are, because that's what we talk about when we talk about a sinful nature. 
But also we recognize that the Bible doesn't start with that, right? The Bible starts by recognizing that what it means to be human first and foremost is to be made in orientation to your creator. And therefore, I think if we're trying to address what is wrong with us, yes, we've got to acknowledge our sinful nature, but more importantly, we've got to acknowledge that we were made to exist in a relationship with our creator. And that includes in a context of our suffering. That's good. Yeah, I think it's one of the things I've appreciated about my friendship with you. And I think even um, some of the resources that we've interacted with over the last couple of years, because I think on the other end, there can be a reductive quality sometimes to some corners of biblical counseling that only sure. think about sin, right? Sure. And don't really think about uh, the holistic nature of what it means to be human. Right. And I think in some ways, it, it's almost like a neo-Gnostic denigration of the body, right? There's this real suspicion that like, I don't think your body really contributes to anything. You're just a soul. You're just immaterial. So we only direct our counseling and even sometimes our shepherding towards the immaterial side, not cognizant of how God has created us as holistic beings, right? Mm. You've done graduate work on that. So talk about that. How do you understand right. the interplay and the interrelation between the immaterial and the material, how the body shapes and in many ways dictates our experience as humans. Yeah, that's a good thought. First and foremost, uh, I think oftentimes part of that uh, instinct of shepherding our impulses or shepherding just merely our behaviors, right, is not an impulse that is unreasonable, right? Because in one sense, when someone comes for help, like I am acting this way, I want to stop acting this way, is appropriate to say, maybe not quite as simply as this, but oftentimes is what comes across is the simple kind of shepherding of like, hey, just stop, <laughs> right? In practice, we know it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, but part of what's insufficient about that, and I think we all experience that in different ways uh, throughout our lives, uh, especially as we receive just advice and care, friends that you know are participating in our lives during the hard seasons and, and want to be helpful. What makes that insufficient is because as human beings, our actions are, are not only are they're never neutral, right? They never come from a place of neutrality, more importantly. Uh, I think the scripture is very clear to, say, to, to use the language of, of our hearts as the control center of who we are. And therefore, out of the overflow of our hearts, right, our mouth speaks, for example. Similarly, then, if we understand uh, theology of the, of the body and all the different dynamics of what it means to be human, I think David Powelson puts this very simply in a helpful way, is that every human being is has these three categories, right? Physically embodied, socially embedded, and spiritually embattled. Mm -hmm. Those three categories that what it means to be a human being and the human experience. What it means by physically embodied is that in a, in a very real way, our bodies tell our story, mm -hmm. right? In a very real way, our bodies in, not only inform, but as you said, dictate uh, who we are and what we do. And and part of what we see even in scripture is that all things in creation are meant to say something true about who God is. And that includes even our, our embodied uh, selves. And well, there's a lot of different caveats into how we can e explore that. But I think that the piece that is really, really important is that every human being, they carry in their body a particular story, right? And according to Psalm 139, it's a story that the Lord knew from the moment that we were in the womb and every day that follows it right? It's part of his plans, purposes, uh, in accordance to Psalm 139. And salvation doesn't obliterate that story, which I think no, is so absolutely not. Absolutely James, not. In James Case, Miss new book, he talks about that, how one of the beautiful things about the gospel of Jesus Christ is God redeems our past. He doesn't whitewash it. He doesn't obliterate it, right? That's right. And so if we have a paradigm of counseling and discipleship that really does that, that like sees salvation as this moment where anything before that doesn't count or doesn't matter or doesn't speak into the present, that we really don't understand how humanity and life works, right? And part of what's important about that too is the simple reality of we can't just think about ourselves as merely a collection of moments, Yeah. right? Good. And oftentimes that's often how we think even of our trials, of our sufferings, right? As I just want to get off this moment. Mm -hmm. I just want this moment to pass when in reality this moment is actually it's part of a bigger story that, that god is working out in your own life to ultimately really it's for your good mm. like every day of your story is part of god's good intentions for you uh we acknowledge that in the womb and and i think we do right to acknowledge that uh on every day especially the days we don't want <laughs> right mm. in our life so if we're talking about uh what it means to be a human being what it means to be an embodied human being uh, this piece of our stories i think is very important it's a very important one because it is it is through our stories that is the, that is the the platform through which god is using to to show himself who he is mm. right we only know god in the context of our story Right? We don't know God through the context of someone else's story necessarily. There are things that we may learn about him, right? But the kind of salvific experience and, and what ultimately what God is doing in our lives is in the context of who, who we are as individuals, right? We can't hijack that or minimize that into cookie cutter type of ways. Mm -hmm. One of the important principles of counseling, and, and I think anybody that would have been in counseling here at Grace would have experienced that, is good counseling is not cookie cutter counseling, right? If I just collect the right kind of verses, if I just find this application to 
with this issue, then all of a sudden things are going to, you know, just turn out okay for your life. I think the faithful expression of biblical counseling is not just desiring to apply scripture to people's lives, but desiring to apply scripture to the person in front of me. Mm. right to the tailor individual in front of me that it would be inappropriate for me even if i'm using the same passage even if i'm using the same verse let's say we're talking about anger in james 1 right and be uh, slow to speak and slow to anger an application to you in your context is going to have to be uh, tailored to you in a certain way yeah. that acknowledges the particular nuances and issues and challenges that you're experiencing in your zip code in your nine to five in your uh, home life that certainly would have carryover and application comparable to other places. If I'm giving you the exact same advice, right, to someone else, at minimum, I'm running the risk of misunderstanding your situation, mm -hmm. right? And, and I'm not listening and understanding to, to your story. Here's the issue that's most problematic. Ultimately, what I'm doing in that is actually I'm running the risk of misapplying scripture, yeah, right? That's good. Because yeah. I'm not taking into account the, the ways in which scripture is meant to be applied to your story, mm -hmm. right? To your life. Which is just how we do exegesis and discipleship anyway, right? That's we understand precisely the thing. a singular meeting in a particular text, but a myriad of applications, right? Yeah, that's precisely the thing. Uh, I think this is one of the things that biblical counseling really challenges us, right? Is that it not only challenges us to understand scripture and know the concept of scripture, but actually forces us to understand people and bridge that gap, right? Between what scripture says and the people that are in front of us which we always have to do, right? Every time we, we're coming to scripture as students, we are trying to learn how, how does it address me personally, right? Uh, I think the interpersonal dynamic of biblical counseling is that it forces us to do that hard exegetical uh, work, especially particularly the work of application consistently in different ways to different people time and time and time again, which just stretches you. I can't do that in a sermon, right? In a sermon, I have to think about two, three, maybe applications that applies generally and broadly to several kinds of people. In counseling, I don't have necessarily that kind of freedom and, and, and I'm challenged, right? Because if I really want to see God's word, right? Taking fruit in someone's life, I need to do a couple things well into so obviously, I need to know God's word, but I really need to know the person in front of me too. That's a good word. So, Wagner, there's a lot that we could say about this. I mean, the easy answer would be go see our statement of faith. But what are some core convictions that kind of undergird uh, our counseling ministry here? For sure. I think off the top that it would be true to just about anything else we do at Grace, right? But it's this acknowledgement of the sufficiency of Scripture that when we say about the Scriptures being sufficient, we, what we mean by that is that the Scriptures would offer us everything we need to live in life and godliness, uh, and that includes the perplexing seasons of our life, right? Oh, the Scriptures are not speaking exhaustively into every issue of our life. The Scripture does sufficiently help us and supply with us with enough direction, enough understanding of ourselves, who God is, and our circumstances to navigate life and circumstances in a way that honors God, which I think that's that's ultimate flourishing, <laughs> right? Mm. And living living life in a way that honors God. So so first and foremost, you're gonna you're gonna hear us talk about uh, the sufficiency of Scripture, which again shouldn't be weird for the life of grace because we talk about that in everything. Another one that I think is really helpful for uh, the experience of of a listener is to recognize that biblically speaking, we we recognize that the root of our behaviors, not first and foremost on external causes, but actually on internal ones, right? That we're not first and foremost uh, victims of our circumstances or subject to uh, the tides and changes and shifts of, of things happening in our life. But the root of our behavior, right? Biblically speaking is is the heart. So that understanding of the dynamic nature of our heart that, that as I said earlier, that out of the overflow of our hearts that our mouth speaks, uh, that is something that we'll continue to talk through consistently in counseling because that's a conversation of responsibility, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because it's very difficult to have a productive conversation about all the things that are outside of my control, but it is very important for me to realize, okay, in my sphere of influence over the things that God has called me to be responsible for, uh, how can I honor him with these things? So the conversation of, yeah, we are accountable to the internal control center of our hearts and accountable for the decisions that comes after that. And maybe the last one that I think is really important for uh, addressing is that real meaningful change actually happens in the context of the church, that the, the secret sauce of counseling is not the perfect equation of getting the perfect counselor and uh, the right kind of verses to memorize, right? Certainly that dynamic is significant. That's what we're talking about. But meaningful change uh, is the A to Z of change is not 
like, you know, five to 10 hours of counseling. The A to Z to change is life in the body. So certainly my counselor can play a significant role in the kind of change and growth that I need to experience. Uh, but the, the place in which I'm going to consistently experience that and frankly have that change be tested, right, is in the life of the church, the organic relationships that are present in the body. And the consistent factor, if we're talking about, yeah, biblical principles, is that the church plays a pivotal role into the kind of person that I need to be, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. I always tell people in counseling that it's going to feel sometimes like change happens in this room here, that That's nothing's right. actually happened. We just talked, right? So it's when you leave and put these principles into practice and then have the accountability, encouragement, support of other Christians who love you and love Jesus to kind of facilitate. That's exactly right. I think one, one of the lines that we often use in counseling, right? Uh, obviously, I, I mentioned earlier about how counseling is not the silver bullet, that just because we're in the room, the magic happens. But the consistent line is that what, what you're experiencing in counseling is not dramatically different than, than what you would experience in the life of the church. What is different in counseling is is the focused nature of this discipleship relationship, right? It is focused because it's it's part- giving particular attention to a, a specific issue, a specific season, a particular kind of suffering, right? But it's not dramatically different than other kinds of, of discipleship that are taking place in this church because while someone else may not have the purview into those details of life that I would be free and want help with, with my counselor, uh, those people are still having a pivotal place in my life by knowing me, by caring about me, my, by what I often say in counseling too, uh, by being the random person that sends me a text message reminding me that he's still praying for me, mm, right? Mm-hmm. The broad relationships of the life of the church may not know every nuance and detail about my life, but they, they are way more pivotal and frankly, way more lasting than the counseling relationship. Oftentimes too, in counseling, we have to remind folks that uh, not only what happens here is not the end all of change in your life, but there's a at least how we do it at Grace, methodologically speaking, there's good reason why most of counseling happens within a, a week or two week break in between sessions. Mm-hmm. Because on, on the other side of a very intense hour or so, right, of conversation and seeking biblical advice, well, we need time to put those things in practice, don't we, right? We need, we need time uh, to experience what was just brought to the table in the context of counseling. And where else, right, are we going to experience that but in the life of the church, but in the relationships and the normal rhythms that are taking place? So when we're talking about some of the biblical convictions and principles orienting counseling, there's more that we can say, but I, I don't think we can pivot uh, any one of those three. I think that's the beautiful thing about what happens at counseling here in a church context is it's really not something wholly other, right? I mean, it really is the same kind of stuff. It's like Taco Bell, right? It's just the same stuff. <laughs> it's just like Taco Bell, he <laughs> Maybe says. more cheese sauce in this particular one. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. But it really is like, it's remedial discipleship, right? It's really intense discipleship in a particular area, but all that's of right. that is not divorced from and certainly is dependent upon ongoing discipleship in other areas, which is why it's hard sometimes when someone outside a church context comes for counseling we can certainly provide some strategies and have good conversations. And certainly the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit can change. But I think in God's intention, the way that we're sustained in change and growth comes right. through accountability and encouragement every week, right? And, and here's why I say what happens in a counseling room is not dramatically different than what happens in the life of the church. Let me say just something really crazy that is going to get me, you know, this is, this is me ensuring that I have no job security. That's why I love you. Yeah, just here for it. Counseling is actually not a requirement. Absolutely. For the life of the Christian. Yep. The church is. Yeah. Consistent, faithful attendance is. Getting to know the person that says next to the pew is, right? That is pivotal. Counseling can be a meaningful and wonderful experience. And obviously, I want to recommend it, right? And certainly, I want to recommend it before, you know, life hits the fan and the bottom drops. It's a lot better to look at the car before it's smoking, isn't it? Mm-hmm. The car smoking. I'm you might smoking. be driving wrong if your car smoking a lot, but that's a different conversation <laughs> for a different time. Fair enough. My point is like, yeah... Probably good advice to like check your car from time to time before you see the, the hood like yeah, like right. you know heating up and, and, and going wild. I think the same principle can be applied to, to counseling. Way better look for advice, look for encouragement, look for direction before you see things falling apart and before you hit crisis. But certainly, what a wonderful opportunity, right? That counseling can afford in the context of crisis as a last resort. What a wonderful what a wonderful place to be. But if we're talking about what is significant, what is most significant for the life of the Christian, it's not the concentrated five to 10 hours with someone who is carrying the title of counselor, right? It is the weekly rhythms of life in the church. Which really demythologizes because I think sometimes people think that the counseling room is a magical place where magical things happen. That's right. Right. And sometimes certainly there are breakthroughs, there are revelations, there's understandings about your past or your present that maybe you'd haven't been able to come to on your own, but it really is the same kind of stuff, right? That's right. And so 
going into counseling knowing that you're going to have similar, perhaps more intense and more focused, but similar kinds of conversations that you've had throughout your spiritual walk. That's exactly right. And that right. the work isn't going to be on the counselor's side. It's going to be on your side. Yeah, right? well said. Well said. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the things too, right? In the demythology. The Breaking the myth, Mythbusters. <laughs> <laughs> the Mythbuster episode of counseling here coming to you at Grace Baptist Church. I like that. Breaking that down is to realize that uh, any good church, tons of counseling conversations are going to happen in between services. Yeah. Tons of counseling conversations. Just like spiritual discipline, Precisely. quote unquote, conversations happen all the time, right? We think about spiritual discipline as this big, like, you sin, now we kick you out of the church. But really, spiritual discipline, in essence, is calling people back to repentance and faithfulness in Christ. 100%. So it should be happening every single day, all throughout Christian relationships. 100%. Yeah, I think it's such a wonderful thing, say, like I say, in between service, after service, I'm walking around the patio. Oftentimes, we presume that it's all chit-chat, right? Until we see someone sitting on a bench with someone with our arm around them. Yeah. Which happens it, every week here. Which happens every, every single, single week. week. What is happening there, right? Other than someone coming with the very consolations of Christ or desiring to do that, right? Aspiring to do that in the Second Corinthians 1 kind of way with the, with the comforts that I've received, right? I want to comfort you. Friends, that is biblical counseling, isn't it? And I, I think part of what, what, makes, what makes counseling feel like, yeah, the oogie boogie is this presumption that um, the formality of it is is what makes it work. Yeah. When in reality, that's the, the formality is just a format. Just it's a just tool. a format. Yeah. Exactly. It's a, it's a it's a tool. It, it, it can serve, and it does serve. I mean, I, I see. I, I do it every day, <laughs> literally. But the function of it, right? Not just the form, but the function of it is one another discipleship uh, in the life of the church. Hey, Grace family, registration is now open for our spring marriage ministry reengage. Starting January 17th for 15 weeks, we will meet together to learn about God's design for marriage and apply biblical principles for building a healthy relationship. Whether your marriage needs to be reignited or completely resurrected, Reengage is a safe place for you and your spouse to reconnect. To register, visit gracebaptist.org slash marriage. Hope to see you there. So talk through, I think, for a lot of people, it can feel like admitting you need counseling, going to counseling feels like defeat, right? It feels like right. you're admitting like, I'm a terrible person. I should be able to figure this out on my own, but I couldn't. So now finally I had to go get counseling. Talk through how you would encourage someone like that and maybe just give like an overview of what the process is like. Because again, I think it, it can seem really magical. and Yeah, tons of sympathy for that, right? I think even perhaps before the, that sense of defeat, there is, it's an uncommon experience to have a measure of shame kind of coming into the kinds of disclosures that counseling presumes, the kinds of, you know, openness that the, the counseling room is, is intended to carry over more than, than thinking that, yeah, I needed, really need to figure out life. And I ran out of resources. Now counseling is my last resort. The shame really comes with the sense of why is this really happening, right? Uh, what is wrong with me? Mm. And I think the encouragement there is to is to recognize that, like, the, for the friend that is navigating these kinds of questions, all I want for him is is to know another friend that can say, "Hey, you're not crazy," right? That those are my questions too. Hundred percent. Right? That I go yeah. to sleep just as conflicted as you do mm. about why things are the way they are. Why are things just so stinking hard, right? I mean, I don't know many times I have thought about that, right? Going to sleep in the middle of, you know, caring for children and all the things that make life difficult. Mm. So uh, I want to acknowledge that for the counselee seeking help, he has a lot more in common with everyone else than he's aware of. Mm. Second of all, I think just because the, the word I use, shame, I think that's something that is a lot more prevalent and way less understood than we give ourselves credit for. One of the things that I often talk about is that shame is never something that I see in an intake form as a, as a presenting problem, as mm. an issue that I'm navigating, but it's in every single counseling room that I've mm. ever walked in my life, right? Simply because if we're talking about our problems, if we're navigating our struggles and even trials of life, yeah, shame is that instinct that is always driving me towards hiddenness as opposed to openness, right? Shame is that instinct that is driving me to to cover up out of self-defense, out of self-protection, rather than allowing myself to experience the vulnerability that comes when I entrust myself to the care of someone else. So for the friend here uh, at, at Grace to to get a sense of, of what counseling, um, 
yeah, might my, my, my look like here at our church. We, we tried to streamline the process really to address some of those things early, early on. Yeah, the goal is not to check IDs and make it as hard as possible at the door every time, right? There's no tithing threshold? There's actually no tithing special. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've tried to pitch it a couple of times, but sure. especially going to the diaper fund. <laughs> but um, the intentionality of our process of, of pursuing counseling is one that is intended to, one, put uh, responsibility and ownership on, on the person seeking and desiring formal counseling. But the way that looks like is to maximize that experience of what I call pre-counseling, right? What is the work that is going to be, that is going to be important to be done before someone ever shows up in a room, which for us looks like a, filling out a counseling application that includes principles of, hey, these are our guidelines of, of what counseling looks like. This is what you should be expecting when you sign up for counseling at Grace. Includes that intake form that unpacks a little bit of different details of life. Well, it's not a little bit. It's a very lengthy application. We even have a little note at the top that it might take you 30 minutes to get through it. Mm. And in the intake form, like I said, we have different details about life, personal information like that. Uh, but also what I, my favorite part of that is the last page of intake, intake form that it's literally stated as a pre-counseling journal where mm. it's just a counselee uh, answering five particular questions, long, um, like stream of consciousness type of way, just long form kind of way to... Um, start to explain, start giving a sense of what is going on, what's happening, uh, what has been done, and uh, what I would like out of this experience of counseling. And then the last piece of replication is our consent form that uh, explains what we mean by confidentiality, That, uh, which I think is really important principle because I think yeah. especially in talking about the the fears that come into counseling, um, the issue of, um, yeah, the who knows, right? Who knows about this? Especially if I'm in my church, right? And I'm going to be counseled by my pastors. I think that can feel very daunting and intimidating sometimes. And that's why in our application, we, we explain that, yeah, when we say confidentiality, Really, what we mean is, is our goal is to steward this, your story, is to steward that with the greatest honor, is to, is to, is to hold what you have to disclose in, in a way that upholds not only your dignity as a human being and made in the image of God, but certainly as a church member, uh, upholds that which is delicate and, and, and deserves attention and care in, in a way that I'll, I'll, I'll hold it as if those are, those are my hurts as yeah. well. But certainly what we don't mean by confidentiality as well is um, this this sense of secrecy, right? And this shady kind of, of way that we're going to keep things um, secret is the right word. Yeah. And then how, how, what's the average length of time for counseling? And then what's graduation yeah. look like? Both great questions. The average length, uh, even in our application, we outline, we require for members to commit to at least five sessions of counseling. So at least five hours. The average case, though, uh, not uncommon that after those first five sessions, you really start getting ground, you start really understanding your counselee and your counselor, vice versa, that relationship gains footing. Not uncommon for most counseling that happens at Grace to last at least 10 sessions. Really because, again, I say this all the time, and this is probably the most consistent phrase in this podcast, is that... In the context of counseling, time is our best friend, mm. right? That there is no shortcut. There's no door number two that makes this painless, that makes this easy, that makes this fast. There's no rushing through godliness, right? But in the context of our suffering, the only one is to make it stop, right? And part of why time is a best friend, and I think counseling allows us to see that, is that it, it takes time to experience the pain and suffering of life with a fresh vantage point, from a fr fresh vantage point, with a fresh sight of what God might be doing with the things that are most perplexing in my life. Because here's the crazy thought about counseling, friends, is that counseling may not resolve your issues, right? But it can give you fresh tools and fresh perspectives to navigate it more effectively in a way that perhaps is a little less debilitating and certainly in a way that with fresh energy and capacity to engage it. Uh, I, I think that's, that's, the, that's the hope ultimately, right? That's what we would love to see the Lord doing in every counseling room yeah. is to see people graduating with, with fresh hope, even if their lives are exactly the same when they first started, because usually they are. And the beautiful thing about graduation as such is it's not like, okay, now we took the training wheels off. Don't crash into the tree down there. Right. It's yeah. that, that person then Lord willing is released back into their ABF, their grace group, their community yeah. that might not even know the particulars of what they've been counseling mm -hmm. through, but is going to continue to point him to Jesus and continue to sustain him in that. Right. Way. Right. Yeah. The language you use here is continuity of care. Right. Yeah. So graduation is really not, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily a, a resolution of all things, but it is a measure of clear insight into what, what, why did I come into counseling and did I get what I wanted to come from this experience? So really we're not talking about some kind of revelation or breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Rather, we're trying to talk about in my scope of responsibility with what God has given me, yeah. right?
do I do I feel capable and, and competent to navigate that in, in a way that honors him and in a way that that because counseling allowed me to even extend to some degree the circle of care of people that know and people yeah. that care for me so that several of my relationships have a counseling feel to them because mm-hmm. of this experience of counseling. Certainly that we're, I'm painting broad brush strokes, but um, I, I think part of why it's important to highlight is, is the simple again, reality that counseling is not a mystical experience. It's something that happens in continuity and consistent that is consistent with everything else we're experiencing in life of the church as well. And also I don't want to highlight I don't want to make per, paint this this picture that all the counseling is 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 just a couple of hours talking to somebody and praying and looking at the Bible verses. Yeah, there are several cases and several scenarios where uh, it is perfectly appropriate to to maintain a counseling relationship that that far transcends the five or ten session mold of things. Well, let's talk about that a second. I think as a committed cynic and skeptic over my whole life. I always like to think about the other end of things. And so realize that there are people who have had bad experiences with biblical counseling and right. there's certainly caricatures out there. Right. So just name some. What are some of the caricatures I think that are thrown about about what biblical counseling is? And then how do we seek to not be that, seek to navigate those? I think a common one and we have already talked about earlier is the sense that um, the things are going in my life are going wrong because I just don't know the right kind of information. Right. right. I think uh, the world can do that. In like if I'd only read Psalm 4 twice, 100%. then I'd be fine. And again, the world can do that can do that as well, right? Uh, 100%, I, yeah. I think so yeah. much of of secular therapies can be like if you just learn yourself a certain a certain way, yeah. then you know you you would unlock your full potential. Literally, that's a book. Yeah. <laughs> but I think uh, biblical counselors can can hijack that same uh, construct sometimes into thinking that yeah, if you just found the right verse, if you just found the right rhythm and pattern, that construct can be applied in biblical counseling as well. And and I think at minimum, what often that does is is just a profound lack of compassion. Right, mm. a profound lack of compassion that is is one failing to understand a person in front of me, and an underrealized theology, right? And then that's the other side of the, the equation, right? Yeah, if one, lack of compassion is one side, it's actually bad theology on the other, yeah. right? That fails to recognize that even in our own sanctification is is not just injecting ourselves with more Bible verses yeah. uh, that makes us grow in likeness to Jesus, right? Certainly, I need to renew my mind. That is part of the whole equation. Transformation happens in the Bible at least in three ways, right? In, in the renewal of the mind, in the reorientation of my identity mm-hmm. from understanding myself as someone that is primarily I identify with things of the earth as opposed to whom my identity is in Christ, in, sealed in heaven, already fixed, right? So uh, renewing the mind, reorienting identity. And the last way that the Bible actually talks about, which oftentimes is what we fix on so consistently in biblical counseling, which can lead to some of these caricatures, is that biblical principle that scripture actually commands us to change our behaviors. Yeah. Right? right. To change our habits, right? Oftentimes, biblical counseling limits our uh, view of change to just that, just change behaviors, just mm-hmm. fix mm-hmm. just fix these habits, rather than, and, and failing to recognize, okay, Bible, the Bible also calls us to renew our minds according to Romans 12. The Bible actually calls us to identify ourselves with Jesus more than we identify ourselves with other things, mm-hmm. right? That's that's Colossians uh, 3. Set your minds on things above, right? That's a whole identity uh, passage right there. So the work of counseling is actually threefold. If we're just talking about ha- habits and behaviors, uh, we're actually having... Uh, part of what makes that bad theology is that it's it's a, it's a truncated view of how sanctification actually works. Yeah, that's good. Sanctification works at our, uh, in, our, in our minds, in our hearts, uh, in the totality of who we are. And that's not even an exhaustive list of the ways in which the Bible calls us to change, right? And I think that's really significant because I think as we talk about uh, how biblical counseling does the same kind of stuff as discipleship, uh, the, the caricature can be, it's just a Bible study, right? You come in, we're going to read a couple passages, ask a couple questions, pray a couple prayers, and bada bing, bada boom, you're fine. Yeah. And so it's certainly, the scriptures are and prayer are vital components of that, but it is beginning to understand who you are in terms of your past and your present, who you are in terms of your choices and the choices other people have made, right? Understanding on some level your sin, but also understanding the ways in which other people's sin has impacted your yeah, understanding of yourself and, and the way you live life. I think John Calvin, right, opens up the institutes in such a helpful way. When And that's something I, I, I think there's so much application to counseling is that the purpose of theology is certainly to know God, right? And by knowing God, we know ourselves. Yeah. Right. And I think that's the piece that sometimes is missed, right? It's not just knowing God. That obviously is the foundation, but then that leads me to know myself. Truly and accurately, right? I yeah. think oftentimes it's easy to equate knowing myself as this self-centered pursuit, mm-hmm. right? But rather knowing ourselves, what we mean by that is knowing ourselves accurately. Yeah, that's good. As we truly are in a way that God sees us more yeah. importantly, right? Which is that so much of that identity God conversation. God self, right? 100%. So we ain't mad at it. That's exactly right. <laughs> and that includes seeing ourselves truly through the lens of scripture in the ways in which scripture will call us to correction. Yeah. Right. But certainly uh, truly in the ways that scripture would see us as image bearers full of dignity. Right. Yep. 
and understand the way the gospel brings healing to the trauma that I've experienced. The gospel brings healing to abuse that I've experienced. The gospel brings healing to pain that I've experienced. Jared, you're talking my language right The here. gospel brings healing to things that I've done to others. hundred percent. Right? This is the piece that I think is often missing, right? And in, in so much counseling is that the hope of the gospel actually reframes how I understand myself and my experiences. Yeah. It doesn't erase, but it reframes it. Yeah. Right. It doesn't coddle. It doesn't portray it as if it's something different than what it really is, but ra rather with a clear as day kind of clarity. It says that at the same time that my experiences are not the sum total of who I am. Yeah. And that's precisely why that piece of our identity in Christ becomes so, mm -hmm. so significant here is that I can understand my experiences truly, uh, be it abuse, be it a profound traumatic incident. Yeah, domestic challenge, whatever it, whatever it might be. Uh, I think part of what we mean about the sufficiency of scripture is that the gospel can actually bring hope yeah. into every corner, into every context of our life, and particularly the parts of our life that hurt the most. What else do we need? Yeah, right. Right? What that's, else do we need? That's work worth doing, right? That's what I'm saying. Like, I want that, you know, when, when I have a bad day at home, right? Yeah. I, th I think that common experience, right? Like in, when, when you can't have one sanctified thought, right? In, in the course of a day. <laughs> right. uh, my goodness, do I need fresh hope? Uh, yeah. do, I, do I need to be reminded of what God says about me and his purposes for me? And not just his purposes for me, but his purposes for all of history, Yeah. right? That he is working all these crazy wild days, diapers and diapers and diapers. He's working that not mm -hmm. just to my good, before his glory. About to right? multiply the diapers too. And I can talk about something trivial like that, but uh, I, I can also talk about something profoundly complex, like the unique nuances of living in a difficult marriage, right? Yeah. Or the unique nuances of, of growing up in a, in a way that you know was not right. Mm. I need to figure out how is the gospel bringing good news into those dark corners of my life as well. Yeah, cheers an amen to that. Okay, so let's just get to it. I always like to ask the, um, the question that is on, a lot of people's minds. So I think when we think about biblical counseling, a lot of times the presumption is that that countermands, replaces, stands in opposition to certain techniques advocated by psychologists and right. even the use of medication to reduce, treat, ameliorate certain problems. So good word. What's, uh, what's your perspective? What's grace counseling perspective? Yep. Nay, what's our perspective? On That's, that right. Right That's right. That's right. Well, several things come to mind. I think the first and foremost that is just important to say it into a blue in the face is that when it comes to medical advice, uh, biblical counselors are not medical practitioners. Thank you. Right? That's first and foremost. And as it relates to the physical health of a counselee, that is a discussion that he should have with his medical doctor. And certainly those things can come up in a counseling room and even in our intake. Like we ask for questions related to medication just so we can understand some of the dynamics at play. It's unethical as a biblical counselor to speak authoritatively into something that is that is not my jurisdiction, right? Yeah. In the same way that I wouldn't speak into a legal case. Right. And it's important to delineate that that doesn't do any violence to the sufficiency of scripture, right? Well, 100%, because I think here's the thing, right? Like if you need financial advice, like your CPA is going to help you, right? If you need medical advice, your doctor is going to help you, right? Part of what biblical counseling is trying to do is not to create a distinction between spiritual advice and physical advice, but rather it's trying to uh, focus on counseling from the scriptures. Certainly financial issues will come up in, in, in the concept of biblical counseling, right? What are biblical principles that will give us wisdom to navigate and care for our finances? Is the context of counseling going to tell you where you should invest all your pennies? Probably not. Probably right? Bitcoin, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But I think the issue of medication, like it's not dramatically different than that. And it's easy to think that it is different, but it's really not. But second of all is that Yes, medication can be helpful in the context of counseling as it relates to symptom relief, right? That's really what we're talking about. It's not my place of a biblical counselor to tell you that you should take this medication or that medication, or maybe you should just jump on a medication necessarily, right? It's not the kind of advice that I think is helpful for the context of the counseling room. But certainly, I think instinctively, I know the fact that if I have a headache, a Tylenol is going to be a great means of grace to care for that headache, right? So that I can listen to my child scream uh, with a little more patience. I often say this as well, that like, it's very hard to be sanctified and be tired at the same time. So sometimes the yeah. most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap, Amen. right? It fixes a lot of problems. I'm telling you. And again, it, 
I'll tell you, a nap has never gonna never addressed any heart issues that I have, but certainly allowed me to have a much better heart, right? Right. <laughs> in many yeah. of the issues that I navigate. So when we're talking about medication, I think I want I want to address that that just the physical components, right? That because we are spiritually uh, embodied human beings, our problems are never merely spiritual, and they're never also merely physical, right? They are always uh, having an interplay with each other. So yes, medication always affects our spiritual life in some ways. Like it can, Good. right? Yeah. It can affect our spiritual life. Positive and negatively for that matter. So those are my big caveats, right? What I don't want to express is the simple thing that um, all of our problems are easily fixed by just taking the right pill, yeah, by just totally. getting the right kind of cocktail. Right. And just right? in the same way that just generally in this conversation, we want to avoid reductive solutions to complex problems. Exactly right? right. I think on either end, either on like the super conservative end or the secular end, just recognizing that God has made us as complex creatures. That's and right. so anytime someone tries to give you a ridiculously simplistic answer to something, it's almost certainly wrong and will do more damage than good. But here's the thing too, though, that I want to have a lot of sympathy in this particular conversation because this, this is the point of sensitivity on it that it's, a, it's an appropriate one. There's a lot of sympathy for that. That as a sufferer, what I want is to make my suffering go away. That's good. Yeah. Right? Yep. Which is okay. It's okay to want your suffering to go Absolutely. Away. I mean, w- creation itself is groaning with you, my friend. Yeah. I think oftentimes the angle of medication is is with this promise that my suffering will end just by taking this medication. And at times it does, right? At least in the acute way in which it's being experienced, right? Between that and your doctor, that's something that comes out okay. Great. What I don't think is helpful though, and I think that's a posture that is all too common, is that all that I need is for my suffering to end. Yeah, that's good. That's all that I need, which is, again, symptom relief is not the end goal of Mm -hmm. change because the change that we're after as biblical counselors, I think this is really the main biggest distinction between biblical counseling and every other form of counseling is that uh, symptom relief, while that is a desirable goal, it is not the end goal, Mm. right? Likeness to Jesus is the ultimate goal. Yeah. Right? It's not less than that, but it's more, right? Exactly. Exactly. I, 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 I want the panic attacks to go away. Yeah. I want the depression to end. Yeah. Right. I want the conflicts to stop. Right. I, I want those things. But at the end of the day, I really, really want for you to understand yourself as a Christ follower in the middle of your suffering mm-hmm. in ways that will give you a whole lot more resilience, way, it will make you way more robust as a human being, right, as a person for the next trial, for the yeah. next season of suffering, right, right? than merely making the crazy stop. Mm. Right. So yes, I want to have a, a common grace approach to medication in, uh, because I think those are common graces to us. But I certainly don't want to paint medication as if it's the silver bullet. Because I mean, yeah, we all know stories too, right? Of of the experiences that weren't positive, right? In the mm-hmm. context of pursuing medication. So it is not a one size fits all, and that's why we depend and lean on the wisdom and proficiency of professionals, right? Yeah. Of, of different sorts and different kinds. And every person, every person is always just going to be one person. So we can't paint mm. broad brushes and here's it the devil's not behind appeal but neither is the savior yeah that's a good word right that's a good word well listen i hope you can hear one of the things i love about wagner and just appreciate about his leadership here and this is true not just of wagner but of the volunteers and staff members that he's training for this is that there's a really kind humble gentle nuanced approach that i think uh, avoids some of the pitfalls that we would see throughout this understanding that these are people are complex you said it several times that the people are not monolithic right every person's unique and so standing on the sufficiency of the scriptures inhabiting nuance loving people and and being kind and empathetic about what they've gone through desiring their best desiring their flourishing through jesus christ uh, listener, I, I think if you are a person that needs help, you're going to find that that's not just true of this conversation, but it really does characterize the ministry. Wagner, if if somebody wants to get connected either to be uh, someone who helps others or they themselves uh, would like counseling, how would they find that here? Yeah. First and foremost, if you have a question about counseling, you should ask. The beautiful thing about Grace Counseling is that uh, it's not just a collective of individuals uh, who very much try to maintain a team approach, which means then, um, yeah, if you if you ask just about anybody in staff, uh, they should be able to competently clarify some of these questions about counseling. I always encourage, like, let's brainstorm before we ever get in the room. Right before we ever start a counseling process, mm. let's let's just spend some time brainstorming. So that's first encouragement. But the second encouragement is to is to highlight that yeah, the application process is meant to be a tool to serve you. So if you were to just pop in on the Grace Baptist website slash care, you'll see right at the top our application to Grace Counseling, and you can spend some time reading over that, praying over that. That certainly will be an encouragement. But here's the thing: 
our, our desire is always going to be to care for the flock, care for those whom God has entrusted under our spiritual care here at the church. So, and if you were to pick uh, a book or two that just been really helpful for you that are accessible to to everybody, what would be some of the resources you recommend? Yeah, so. Two books come to mind. I think I'm not so much concerned of people that want to be biblical counselors, but people that want to be good friends and being good for, by being good friends, caring for their friends with Bibles open type thing. First and foremost, I think Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands by Paul David Tripp. That's a required reading for interpersonal discipleship and caring for one another, even his whole framework. It's uh, how we frame everything that we do in counseling. That's first and foremost. And the second one that I think is just really, really good, uh, helpful reading to understand our own hearts and the ways that the scripture talks about it is The Dynamic Heart uh, by Jeremy Pierre. who was a professor I had over at Southern. And uh, similarly, I think if, if Paul Tripp kind of lays out for us the dynamics of interpersonal care for one another, I think Pierre helps us understand uh, who the nature of our own hearts as we care for one another. So require reading there. If there's one thing that I do consistently is read. So if you ever have more questions, uh, please indulge me with uh, book recommendations. I love that. Well, it sounds like people could also bless you with diapers. Uh, both newborns and maybe larger sizes. So One, Grace, two, three, four. Yeah. All as you see Wagner around, maybe just bring a box of diapers. Wagner, <laughs> thanks for your time. There's a lot more we could talk about this, but this was a fun conversation. Thanks, Likewise. Man. Yep. Fun times. Thank you so much for joining us today. Make sure to subscribe to Magnify Podcast so you never miss an episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with others. Post about it on social media or leave a rating and review. We would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask in our mailbag, you can email them to magnify at gracebaptist.org and we will answer them on the show. Thank you so much for streaming.